everyone in this room. So I would like to see hands raised from everyone in the audience um, who is already using FFV1 and Matroshka as a preservation or intermediate for it. Oh, wow. Half Half finger. <laughs> <laughs> we are using FFV1 with AVI, yeah, that's okay. true. <laughs> so other formats in use, like um, MXF, um, JPEG 2000. No. And and, um, we, we use MXF, but not in, with JPEG 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Half <laughs> And uncompressed? And that uncompressed? Okay. And now I also would like to see hands from, from those who actually consider to implement FFV1 and Matroshka as a preservation format in future. Seriously, <laughs> My first question would be um, for Carl. Um, do you or FFmpeg know um, how widespread FFV1 is in use? Is it also is it only used in the archive world or also like outside the archive world? I I would assume that it's not only used in the archive world, uh, but um, there are no real statistics. I would say it's a uh, it's a property of an open source project that you cannot easily know the number of your users. VLC does have a statistics. We, we don't have statistics at all. Um, I, I know that people are using FFV1 because of last year in Vienna, and I talked to many people, and I know from Dave that he talks to even more people, so apparently it is definitely used. And since it started as a non archiving community project originally, I think it's safe to assume that other people use it as an intermediate format. After all, it's, it's, it's lossless and maybe they have a problem transferring something from one system to another. So I'm sure it is used, but as said, um, there are no real statistics. And there are bug reports and that is also a good uh, indicator that people are, well, trying to use it at least. Do you agree? Uh, sure, yeah. There's no statistics, I know, either. And, and Dave, could you, before we really start the discussion, could you um, quickly summarize the advantages or maybe disadvantages of FF31 version 3 and Matroshka in comparison to other formats? And like, like um, yeah, tell about a bit about the, like, the key features of this codec. Uh, sure. So um, I. I guess the advantages of FFV1 in particular would, would be true for, for many lots of formats, but obviously uh, size is significant. Uh, it will generally be about a third smaller than uncompressed if, or, uh, if it's coming from an analog source. Uh, I find often when it's coming from like a, if I'm converting like a digital video tape to FFV1, it might often be a, quite a lot smaller. Um, but the you know the, it's the size means the file is faster to inspect, to move, to check some, to rsync. Uh, it, it so it just kind of makes the entire workflow uh, go faster, and also then the archive is creating much less e-waste than it would <laughs> ordinarily be doing if it was storing uncompressed. Um, but I, I like to stress that size is not uh, the predominant feature when you're comparing FFV1 to uncompressed. Uh, it also has a lot of self-description. Whereas uncompressed really has no ability to describe itself, it's fully reliant on the container to, to describe it. But FFV1 can say things about its own aspect ratio and interlacement and other sorts of data. And then um, probably most pertinently is that FFV1 uh, stores, uh, at least version three onward, stores checksums of each frame and optionally of each uh, slice of a frame within it. Uh, so if you have any digital damage to your file, you can identify precisely what, what frame it's in and what part of the frame is, is impacted. And because the checksum is um, documenting such a relatively small amount of data, it, it adds for the possibility to use the checksum to correct the error, you know, by like reversing the polynomial division of the CRC to like find which bit was flipped to it to undo it. As if you have a checksum documenting a very large amount of data, it becomes less feasible to use the checksum for error correction. 
Um, yeah, but then the video archiving domain, the interest in FFUN definitely seems to increasing. Um, and there has been tremendous work um, done by you and others here at the event to standardize both FFUN and Matroshka. Meanwhile, there are efforts to adopt it um, for preservation use. And uh, could you tell us, um, Dave, um, where we are at the moment, uh, what are the next milestones um, regarding sanitization and adoption? Uh, yeah, I talked about that slightly in my previous talk, but uh, I think F51 is currently assigned for more of reviews for other working groups, and then I think we'll respond to the information that comes from there and make some changes. Uh, but then soon after, I think the FFP1 document will go into last call uh, mode, and then eventually it will go to the Internet Engineering uh, Steering Group to, uh, you know, adopt it and assign it an RFC number. And what time frame? I'm sure there there is a time frame on the the website, but I think all the the deadlines are likely in the past if you <laughs> reviewed it, uh, because uh, you know <clears throat> we're all volunteer contributors, and uh, you know when we have time, we can work on it. But I think you know it's been making progress at a, at a good pace. Um, you know, and I expect to see see it finalized soon. Um, Related to that, I, said, I think in the specification group, there's been a lot of work to ensure that we're not making any change that breaks the current implementations. We don't want to make a specification, a change to the specification that would communicate that the existing files are suddenly wrong. Because thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because that would be that. You know. <laughs> we appreciate it. So I think if you look in the specification, you'll see some parts where it's like, okay, uh, it's RGB, but if it's between, uh, like, um, say, like 13-bit to 15-bit, then it's RBG <laughs> because of a mistake in the encoder. So instead of uh, forcing in the specification, we have to document the exception and then to say this will be fixed in version FFP1 version 4 onward. Because there are a few instances where we found uh, the, the prior implementations of FFP1 uh, had some discontinuity in them. So we'd have to, to clarify them in the specification rather than to say, no, everything should be clear in a way that would uh, invalidate existing files seems like a very sensible approach. Uh, I remember the VP9 specification that was finished and sent out, and in the end, when we found differences between the implementation and the specification, it was simply said, well, the specification is wrong, you have to look into the implementation. <laughs> yeah, implementation is a good word. Um, Jana, I know that you're just starting to implement FFV1 and Matroshka at base. Um, could you tell us about um, like the process so far? Sure. Um, just um, to contextualize, MACE is a small um, independent charity or organization. Um, we have eight employees, five of whom are full-time, three are part-time, including myself, so I work three days a week at MACE. And um, I don't have very much time for the um, absorbing of all of the information of things like FFV1, that kind of thing. I feel like a bit of an imposter here, I'm afraid. But um, we have, I have been heavily influenced by previous No Time to Wait events, and having read um, white papers like the uh, Indiana University's one, which has been mentioned a few times today, um, I've sort of I started seeing FFV1 as a, as a rock in, in a very turbulent sea of, of codec um, confusion. So it's, it's somewhere I'm kind of I've tried to try to start investigating. Um, we got FFmpeg given to us on a computer by one of our trustees two years ago, and I my early investigations with FFmpeg really came about because of not being able to find other options and knowing that FFmpeg had a lot of resources and a lot of um, um, ability to to sort of deal with issues. I would research online, so quite simply go to forums, ask the right question, how do I do this thing, and then a, a result would come up, and then I would have to experiment with that result a little bit. So I really do have no background in programming whatsoever. I'm a video producer originally. Um, so the first steps with FFV1 for us have been um, perhaps a little clumsy, but we've found I've found that it can it is quite easy to implement. Um, my first concerns at hearing that BFI, who are our partner, um, was a lot, and they influence an awful lot of the decisions that MACE makes, 
um, that they were going to take FFD1 on um, was um, a little bit nervous about support, whether we would have kind of spaces where we could talk to people to find out how to, how to cope with it. But through my own kind of just initial investigations and experiments, I found it much easier to work with than I anticipated. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's... it's um, the support is online if you look for it it takes a little time it'd be nice maybe if there was a resource where we could all um, find codes that were available ready for the archiving industry that we could then apply more quickly and easily as a way of perhaps finding our feet sooner but yeah um, I started some experiments with um, initially just creating FFV1 files and putting them onto the slightly aging quality control computers that um, belong to MACE and they wouldn't play back very well, so I, I went back to the FFV1 cheat sheet, which I found online. Um, I read something cursory about uh, slices and multi-threading. I didn't really understand what that meant, I'll be honest. But I started experimenting with the with the slices and um, was able to generate. Um, I think the default for my um, FFmpeg, which is version 3.4.2, because I've got an older operating system on my Mac. Um, gave us four slices as the default, so I then just created four, eight, 16, 24, 30, and then put them onto the, the QC and computers and tried playing them back, and I found that there was a slight increase in, in ability to view the files on these aging computers, and I feel with some tweaks to the hardware we might be able to perhaps view those files natively. Um, before, we couldn't view anything other than MPEGs on those computers, so we've never been able to watch V210 uncompressed. So the hope for me, I think, um, with adopting FFV1, amongst many other things, is that we might be able to do away with um, mezzanine levels when we are free to do that. You know, when industry can take FFV1, then we might be able to get rid of a massive amount of storage, which is at the minute given over to ProRes files, for example. So, um, I hope that's... <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. It's, it's, a, it's a very kind comment, and uh, not everybody agrees with you, but uh, <laughs> thank you for saying so. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe Dave, I'm wondering what is kind of the, the general slice option, like if you don't like choose? Uh, I'm not sure what the default is. Uh, the the, the slice is, is referring to like the, 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 the image of the frame, is is cut into pieces that are encoded separately and then um, combined together for storage. So it's a way, like, if, if your computer has you know 16 processors and you say I want to make it 16 slices, the work is just subdivided and then stored. So it it uh, just uses your computer's resources more efficiently when it's both encoding and decoding. Whereas if if your frame was just one single encoded image, you'd have one processor to decode it and the rest of your computer would just kind of like sit and relax as only a part of your computer is going to work. No, I, say that well. I think so. Um, I believe that the format was originally not developed with the, with the, it wasn't an important goal that playback in real time is possible. It was more important to reduce the size. Uh, and luckily, since today's computer typically have uh, multiple uh, CPU cores and you can use slices, you get a result that should be playable at least on, on reasonable hardware, depending on this on the resolution of the original frames. So it is it should at least be possible to solve the issue. And if we use F of one, um, what other uh, things should we kind of um, yeah focus on or or um, um, yeah what are other details that FFV1 can become like a Noah's art, like the intra frame um, encoding and, and so on. Could you? Um, yeah, I guess normally in FFmpeg I use this option that's dash G1. That's just saying every frame should be kind of self self contained because otherwise, um, in information for one FFV1 frame would be recycled to the other, and the size of the file would be reduced a little bit. But the, the issue would be that if you had a small amount of damage to the file, it would impact multiple frames, um, or potentially multiple frames. So generally, I use dash G1 to just say I want every frame to be by itself. Um, as opposed to like with an H.264 stream, you might have a second worth of frames uh, kind of all encoded as like a group of, of pictures. 
I, I want to mention that the effect of using another value than one is uh, usually not visible. So there is no disadvantage normally in using uh, G1. Yeah, it, 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 will pl it will play the same and look exactly the same, but it does affect how resilient the file is and how it would respond to damage. That's what I mean. I mean, there's only an advantage, and there is so far uh, not easily to see any disadvantage using uh, G1 because it does not affect the file size, if I remember correctly, so far. And then other than that, I, tr I try to make sure that the file is depicting the correct interlacement and aspect ratio. Um, like there's some formats that we can digitize to, like if you digitize to like uncompressed in AVI, there's no standardized way to define interlacement or aspect ratio. Um, so if you're converting that information into FFV1, it will just have the same unknown properties. Uh, so since FFV1 can clarify properties like that, I usually like to make sure that they are set as I'd expect them to be set. Uh, so if the content is really interlaced, that the FFV1 understand it to be interlaced as well. I hate to correct you. Yeah. <laughs> AVI did define an aspect ratio. The Windows Media Player does not support it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, may I ask about slice uh, CRC? Um, that's something I've read a lot about as a as a real excellent failsafe for FFV1. But as a user on FFmpeg, um, how, how can I experience what 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 that's bringing to my experience? I mean, how how do I get notified of errors that might occur, for example, when I'm encoding a file? Uh, when you de when you decode the file with FFmpeg, if there is a slice or frame CRC error, it will report it, and I think it gives the presentation timestamp, so it will say, like, in five seconds, there's a, a mismatch error. Um, I know when I, when I was first using FFP1, I, I thought it was very good that there's frame checksums, because I can know where the error is, but I was like, but then do I, like, what would be so motivating to know which slice is then having the error? Like. Is like I understand the value to know. Okay, in, in eight seconds in, there's some damage. But do I have to know that at that frame, it's in the second row and the, the third block over? <laughs> like, do I need to know the geography of it? Um, but I realize that kind of information is is relevant for error concealment. So that if the frame is damaged, instead of showing just this kind of like psychedelic rainbow pattern of wrong data, uh, because FFmpeg's decoder will know wh where spatially the error is, it can conceal it by copying data from the prior frame. So when you're watching it it, it, it might not be noticeable as an error at all, but it will be uh, logged in the output of FFmpeg to say that the error did happen and where it was. But I think if you just had the frames ERC, it, it wouldn't know where to put the concealment. I have the last question um, for Joanna, and then would open the panel to the audience. Um, Jana, if you would implement FFV1 and Matroshka, like how would your uh, workflow look like? Like, would you like digitize um, directly into FFV1, or would it be like, yeah, like preservation mask in a file? Um, okay, that's brilliant. Yes, um, I, I would really like to uh, have our workstation that captures at the moment capturing directly to FFV1. It's a question that. It's still open-ended for me at the moment, um, mainly because when we capture videotapes, we also have to have some sort of editing function prior to exporting that for <coughs> preservation. So, um, I've eyed QC tools as, as one option, and, sh and Shotput, I think, is as an editing software option. But I would definitely love to um, talk more about that with, with the panel here, certainly. Um, but yes, but ideally, at the minute, I think. Um, I'm also very interested in raw cooked in the developments that are going on there, but I would very much like to start wrapping all of our um, tape captures in FFV1 immediately, so that we can go straight to LTO tape, which is the final destination for them. Um, yeah, what do you recommend for software for capture? That would be great. Uh, I mean, I've used I've used Shotput a bit, and I, I use sh Shotput or Cut. I can't remember. Shotput, yeah. Um, but I, I've used that for playback because it supports uh, bl the Black Magic cards we have. So when you, you play in it, you can also play out to a monitor. So you can inspect your FFP one with various broadcast tools. Um, and for us, when we were trying 
For the editing issue, I, I know we kind of struggled with this dilemma when we started digitizing because on one sense we want to digitize videotape in its entirety to maintain the color bars and the slate and everything, and then there's the content inside of that that we want to make accessible. And then sometimes there's something at the end, like more black or you see the source tape or winding or something. Um, so our well, options at the time seemed to be to digitize the entire tape and to, to edit it, to have the content in what's before and after as three separate files, uh, or to only digitize the content and ignore the other material on the tape. Um, but both of these seemed a bit burdensome. Uh, what we eventually ended up doing would be to digitize the entire tape and then when we're logging the digitization event, uh, two pieces of metadata we would store is what time the content starts in that recording and stops. So we might know we have like a 32 minute recording, but it has a 29 minute piece of content inside that we want to make accessible. And the rest is like color bars and stuff that we want to keep, but we shouldn't be part of the access copy. So then we, we wrote uh, like a bash script to use FFmpeg to transcode that master file into an access copy, but to use the in and out times for our metadata. So in that sense, we don't actually edit, we just are communicating the time range to the transcoding that makes it accessible. And that, that saves us a lot of time. Like, but uh, we had to implement it, but once everything was ready, it, it made things quite a bit simpler for us. Um, sorry, uh, I didn't really answer the workflows. Um, I just realized I got too excited about Capture. <laughs> um, uh, at, at the moment, we are re-encoding, we have been up until this point, um, uh, as part of a submaster relocation project. Um, AVI wrappers um, with uh, uncompressed or variable codecs inside them. We've had some old codecs like YE, Y2, which are no longer supported. So I've been using FFmpeg um, on a directory base automation kind of um, so I'll put the files in that need the re-encoding um, into a directory and then I will leave them working in the background so I think one of the biggest strengths of FFmpeg for us um, as well as FFV1 is that you can set terminal going in the background and I can work on other projects in the foreground because um, my job is very much about meeting um, requests from clients every day so I come in and I've got a big pile of job requests and I have to do that first and foremost and then the the kind of re-wrapping, re-encoding is going on very much in the background. And that's the strength of FFmpeg for me, is that it allows me to use one or <coughs> two work sessions and achieve a good deal in a very short amount of time. So yeah, it's very much directory-based, attempting to start automation processes. Personally, I'd like to know a bit more about Python so that I can perhaps use some of the free Python codes that people like the uh, Irish Film Institute are making available. So yeah, um, what I need, that's, that's a that's down the road from here, from where I am. Um, the exciting thing for FFV1, for me really, I know you said earlier it's not so much about size, but for me it really is about size because day to day I don't have very much time. So infrastructurally it's going to cost less. Um, FFmpeg, obviously FFV1 is free already, which is a massive bonus. Um, but also just being able to transfer those files from one location to another. Write in into LTO, I'll need half the space hopefully um, to store them on LTO, which is another cost saver. So these are all massive benefits to, to my sort of short amount of working time each week. And yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I would like to open the panel for the audience. <laughs> You shout the person that you want to have. Hi, I'm Peter B. Um, I just wanted to quickly add about some questions like the slices, the number of slices. Um, when I was involved in development of F1.3, I made massive tests on crop size and slices and performance. And rule of thumb is like, if you can divide the slices by the number of cores that you have, you get a pretty good performance value. Um, a number I like to run right now is 24. It performs quite well on at least some part, like depending on the resolution. But there's no one size fits all number because it really depends on what you want to encode it and you don't know what you're going to decode it with. So something that has a lot of common denominators <laughs> works. Quite well from performance. Mm -hmm. And as Carl, when you said before, 
We hate to disagree with him, but we do disagree with him. I hate to disagree with you, but uh, in, in my test, maybe I should repeat them, actually. I want to repeat them. Is the GOP size. Yes. Michael said test for a GOP size 1 and 300. Yes. And there is a size um, gain when doing, like, large GOP size of 300. But there's the two paths that everyone could do, but it's not stable. Um, if you have longer sequences, but if you do a two pass, you can do a GOP size one encoding with the same compression gain as a GOP 300, mm -hmm. but with the high frames only. Mm -hmm. And then there was another thing that I forgot. To <laughs> yeah, about the capture stuff, um, there's actually for Windows only, because um, we couldn't do it for, for cross platform, uh, a virtual dub fork. <coughs> now it's called virtual dub two that supports F51 encoding and decoding by built-in f 10 And you can use this for direct capture to F51 and also do it in and out. Um, export. Yeah. I'll leave the rest of the next Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. None of that was a, was a question. Kiran <laughs> <laughs> has a question. Uh, there's a question for, I think, Joanna, what was your name? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah um, I also work on FMPEG with Carl, um, and it's really nice to hear that you're using it. Um, and there's many people that say, oh, it's unusable unless you're a super, uh, uh, unless, I forgot the phrase you used, but um, you're, you know, you understand <coughs> the ins and outs of video to this. Um, so that's really good that you both do that. So, but what more can we do uh, as FMPEG to make it easier for people like you, because you're, if anything, you're the perfect example. You have well, weak computers. Um, it's just a, you're part time. It, it's just a thing that you end up having to do. You're not the expert. What, what more can we do as a peg? Because I'm not going to call them the other side, but the other side <laughs> seems to be uh, the whole MXF world. Seems to be they seem to be obsessed with making things, to creating barriers to entry and creating gatekeeping and making things super complicated worldwide. You need to you need to become a Specifications lawyer to even understand what they're talking about. What can we do as a friend to make it easier for people like you? Oh, thank you. Um, I think um, resources. Uh, I mean, I spend a lot of time on the internet. Um, I think my job is more or less um, research, research, research. So even though I've got other th other responsibilities, I'm I'm always kind of on the internet looking for answers, and I'm on forums a lot, um, finding what other people like myself, I suppose, are, are posting on their support to each other. Um, I think from an archiving uh, perspective, it might be really nice, as I said earlier, to have um, an area where archive-specific FFmpeg codes might be really useful. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's difficult. It's, it's not completely difficult. I haven't found it too hard um, to, to experiment. Uh, my first, um, I think the very first thing I had to do was to take a DPX um, image sequence and try and get it to work on my Mac, um, which had Premiere Pro on. I couldn't take in the DPXs, the processors just couldn't handle it, I couldn't play them natively, so I thought, how can I deal with this? And um, I remember some moment of inspiration, just thinking maybe I can use FFmpeg to convert this image sequence into a ProRes 444 bar. And I found three or four different examples on, on the internet most of which, none of which actually worked as they were from what I found. And I, I ended up just experimenting and messing and kind of chopping it around and then eventually one worked and I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> Kept that one close to hand ever since because before we, um, we got our DPX hardware installed, um, I was using it all the time and it was really essential. So I guess creating spaces where we can communicate with each other about these things. I know Amia has an FFmpeg um, section that I have. Shame to say I've never looked at it because um, I will go straight to forums <laughs> and straight to Google. Um, so yeah, creating areas, maybe um, places where we can just communicate with each other, rookies, you know, and maybe get get hands-on contact with people like yourselves every now and then. Thank you, dear panel. I uh, need to cut you short here. I'm very sorry, but we need to continue with our program. Um, thank you very much.